Hello, everybody, and welcome to the keynote presentation at the 2023 Micro-Credentials Forum uh, being broadcast live from the studios uh, around Ontario uh, of eCampus Ontario. I'm really, really excited about uh, today's discussion. Uh, we've got two leaders uh, here to talk with us about Ontario's competitive edge driving Ontario forward. Uh, really pleased to be introducing Dr. Raad Kadri, who's the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives, Business Development, and Head of the Ontario Vehicle Innovation Network, or OVIN, here in Ontario, and Amanda Sayers, who's the Director of Skills, Talent, and Workforce Development for OVIN. Yesterday, uh, we heard a lot about the importance of partnerships uh, between the private sector and uh, the uh, post-secondary educational institutions, and, uh, and what can be done to ensure that we are supporting as much as possible the reskilling and upskilling needs of critical uh, economic sectors in the province. Now, the automotive industry is one of those. As I noted yesterday, uh, it's one fifth of our exports, employs 125,000 people, $14 billion into our GDP. Uh, these are uh, all of this make it really, uh, really significant from an economic and a social perspective. And it's also one of the areas that is most impacted by the transition to a no or low carbon economy. And uh, I don't know if you follow uh, Raad like I do on the social media. Uh, he's pretty active on the LinkedIn uh, with everything to do with uh, electric vehicles and uh, a lot of the work that the government is doing right now to attract investment in the automotive industries of the future. Uh, so with that, um, I would encourage you to go to the website and check out their bios, um, but I know that you're in for a really, really great presentation today. So I'm going to turn it over to Raed to uh, kick us off. Please, Raed. Raed, oh, you're muted, Raed. Thanks, Robert. Try again. <laughs> Uh, and I'll take the opportunity to uh, to say I'm not quite Dr. Raid Kadri yet, but I am working diligently on uh, becoming that too. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for the, the kind introduction. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate being here today with everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, very important topic, very important uh, conversation to have uh, and continue to have. So uh, as Robert mentioned, I'm Raid Kadri and I head up the Ontario Vehicle Innovation Network or OVEN. Uh, OVEN is championed by the Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade of Ontario, MEDCAD. Uh, and in partnership with the Ministry of Transportation and the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training, and Skills Development. Uh, and so through OVEN, it's a key is the government's key, it's a it's a key component of the government's driving prosperity plan. And what that is is the plan that the government put out uh, a few years ago to pave a path forward for the future of our automotive mobility sector. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why that's so important to Ontario and why it continues to be important uh, into the future. So through OVEN and, and as a part of Driving Prosperity, we're, we're working diligently on accelerating the development of the next generation of connected, electric, autonomous, and mobility technologies, as well as ensuring that we're supporting Ontario's role as the manufacturing hub of Canada. In, uh, through OVEN, we're enabling we're also enabling the province's transportation infrastructure networks to plan for and adapt to this transformation. This includes support for small and medium-sized enterprises to develop, test, validate, commercialize new automotive and mobility technologies, support for talent and testing and demonstration sites. So what that means is when we first started this in Ontario, we set a course differently than other jurisdictions. And our thesis was that if we support the commercialization of new technologies in our province through Ontario companies, those companies will naturally test and pilot those solutions on our roadways. So one, we're reaping the economic opportunities, the, the, the increased economic and job creation opportunities that's being presented by this transformation that's happening. But also what we're doing is we're reaping the social and environmental benefits that these technologies promise. And that is, uh, that is increased safety, of course, accessibility, and cleaner transportation across our province. So we're doing an incredible job in this in, in Ontario and OVEN is very much the brand and the umbrella of everything that Ontario is doing in all stakeholders across our province to drive the future of our automotive sector. And I can tell you that globally, it is a well-renowned initiative and, and, and that everybody looks to what we've done in this province to coordinate ourselves and work together so that we can own the future of this sector and we continue to do that. 
through Oven, we also have a group called the Central Hub. And the idea is to do exactly what I said, is, is to lead province-wide coordination of activities and resources, to act as a bridge between policy and technology, to drive public education, strategic partnerships, research and thought leadership, and very much drive the future of Ontario's push into this sector. Our skills, talent, workforce development team, and you'll hear a little bit later from our director, uh, as, as Robert mentor, uh, mentioned, Amanda Sayers, is working diligently on future-proofing the province's automotive and mobility workforce through the development of programs and tools designed to engage, upskill, and reskill current and future talent. And, and what's important about that is that we're doing such a great job in this province, and globally, we've always been known to have the talent and the workforce that enables us and that drives our growth in this province. And we want to make sure that we have that for years to come. And we're working very diligently in a coordinated province-wide fashion to keep pushing that forward. And so to truly understand how bright Ontario's automotive sector's future is, and if you haven't been paying attention, let me tell you a little bit more about what's been going on. Um, and I'll tell you where we started and where we're continuing to grow and push forward. And, you know, Ontario is, is emerged on the top of the global uh, news in terms of new investments and growth in this sector. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So Ontario started in the automotive sector in the early 1900s. Large-scale automotive production facility was established in Canada, in fact, in Windsor, Ontario, which, by the way, happens to be my hometown. Proud Windsorite, I talk about it very often. For over a century, this province has been a global leader in the production of vehicles. And with that always comes the supply of technologies, products, and services to support new vehicles globally. Ontario is home to five, the only subnational jurisdiction that has five automakers that manufacture in our province, General Motors, Stellantis, Ford, GM, and Honda, and Toyota, sorry, Honda and Toyota. And that's a very important to note because we are the second largest manufacturer of vehicles in North America. That goes very much unnoticed whenever I tell somebody that anywhere, either whether in Ontario or across the globe, they don't realize how substantial Ontario's automotive sector has always been. Sometimes we make a little bit more than Michigan, sometimes we make a little bit less, but at the end of the day, we average it as the second largest producer of vehicles in North America. Incredible. Very important to our economy, very important to a lot of things across uh, our province and across the sector. With that, as I mentioned, we have over 700 suppliers uh, of technology, of parts, of solutions into the automotive sector. Companies like Magna, Linamar, all the way down to small and medium-sized enterprises that supply both in our province to the manufacturers that we have here or to uh, the next tier group or supply globally. So it's a fairly substantial industry and also 500 tool and die and mold makers that are providing products and services to their customers uh, globally. It's also important to note that Ontario is the second largest ICT cluster, information and communication technology cluster in North America with over 35,000 ICT firms. So when, when, a few years ago, when the world was transforming, the auto sector was transforming, well, I like to characterize it, the technology sector kind of got into the auto sector and the auto sector pushed back and said, we are gonna own the future movement of people and goods. Any jurisdiction was looking to have all the right ingredients to really, capitalize. And I see this is always, we've always seen this in this province as an opportunity, an opportunity to insert our small, medium-sized enterprises, our entrepreneurs, our innovators into the supply chain so that they can get into the global market. And then that return and that, those economic uh, opportunities come back to our province and we continue to grow. So you take us being the second largest producer of vehicles in North America. So a very substantial globally recognized automotive sector. The second largest ICT cluster in North America, which we don't talk about enough, but it's starting to be recognized more and more. And then, you know, this is at the beginning. And then you take now the fact that we have the, all the critical minerals you need to build batteries. I'll talk about that a little bit later. We put these all together. And if you can move to the next slide. And essentially what we did was we created uh, uh, an initiative to ensure that we drive the future of the automotive sector. And that's open. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the technology trends in the automotive mobility sector, because they're changing rapidly. Uh, when we first started this, when the transformation was happening, it came with self-driving cars. And so uh, and, and, and we were learning as we were going. So was the sector. The sector was forecasting that they're going to have automated vehicles, autonomous vehicles, fully autonomous vehicles on the roads by 2020. Well, we know that didn't happen. 
Uh, but incrementally, we have gained new technologies and there's great opportunities. And we've had Ontario small, medium sized enterprises actually be the ones who come up with these leading edge solutions and get them into the global market, which have incrementally increased safety in the vehicle. Remember, that is the priority is increasing safety in the vehicles. And with automation came connectivity and connectivity was about getting more information to the vehicle so that it can make the right decisions. So uh, as we push forward and then just a few years ago, the world went electric decide to go electric. So we're now seeing the following trends. Increased demands for electric vehicles. Um, battery technology advances in, in development, growth in development of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So electrification is full full course. I would say the number one priority because I think it's the, the, the low hanging fruit uh, for the auto sector in terms of technology. And so uh, you see all automakers starting to put out electric vehicle platforms and they're ramping up very quickly. This is also being driven not only by consumer demand, but also by regulations. And that's typically how the auto sector works is that technological advancements are actually often driven by either consumer demand or regulations. And so electrification is full blown, electric vehicle platforms are coming online. Everybody's racing to figure out how they can build the next battery that increases range, that powers uh, heavier vehicles, and of course, with all that, we're, we're everybody's looking to deploy uh, infrastructure that will support this uh, this network. Just like we have gas stations all across our province, we need infrastructure across the province and across the globe. Because when you drive your car, you want to make sure that you can charge it and, uh, and and keep going. The other thing that we're seeing is an advancement in IoT for automotive applications, and so lots of great technologies coming in. Uh, in terms of uh, increasing the affordability and adoption of these systems, such as sensors and cameras inside the vehicle. Sensors and cameras are uh, very important as into the automation part of the vehicle. I mean, when we say, when a lot of people think of auto autonomous vehicles, they think of the self-driving cars that you see, but really everything is incremental. And so you see more sensors, you see more communication with the vehicle, you see the vehicle supporting the driver's functions more and more. And I can give you some great examples. I won't take too much time to tell you that, but I'm happy to share uh, one of my personal examples in terms of how some of these automation uh, technologies have supported me in the, in the past. Self-driving vehicles enabled by machine learning and AI. Self-driving is not going away, but I would tell you that there's probably a better understanding of the timelines when it comes to self-driving. That doesn't mean that artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies and solutions are not still top of mind for all automakers, not only for the vehicle functions, but also now they're starting to look at passenger uh, comfort passenger communication because in in the uh, let's say level five world where vehicles drive themselves there's more time for the passengers so how do you get we're starting to see great technologies of Ontario around virtual assistance in the vehicle to first starting off helping a driver understand the handbook has anybody here ever looked at their vehicle handbook probably should but now they're looking at how to use artificial intelligence to get it inside the uh, the brain of the vehicle so that you can easily ask a question hey uh, X, Y, and Z, how do I change my tire? And so um, we're seeing some great technologies of our province in that area. Increased adoption in, uh, of, and complexity of autonomous driving systems, as I mentioned, it's incremental. And so we continue to push forward slowly. It's very important to note that Ontario was the first Canadian province to release in, back in 2016, uh, automated vehicle uh, uh, pilot program. And so that allowed provided a, a mechanism to allow the testing of vehicles in our province, and that was since updated since 2019. Um, it's been uh, well acknowledged by the industry as a, a, a perfect balance with prioritization of safety, but in, enabling innovation. So safety always a priority, but allowing innovation to thrive. And so uh, we continue to uh, leverage that, and it, it actually resonates very well globally. I had a meeting last week, actually, where that hit the mark in terms of attracting the attention of a, of a global automaker in terms of doing more research and development in our province. And of course, digitalization, increased connectivity, uh, enabled technologies. I don't have to tell you folks, this is the stuff that um, we see more and more in our vehicle, cars connected to uh, uh, the network. And through that, you get all kinds of new functions and features that have to do with that, uh, including uh, data analytics needs for vehicle performance analysis and cybersecurity, of course, is becoming uh, a priority. Cybersecurity, I once heard from an industry uh, leader that, uh, you know, safety is the priority of the automotive sector, of course, number one priority, and cybersecurity is quickly becoming attached to safety uh, as the vehicle becomes more and more digital. So it's top of mind for automakers, top of mind for suppliers. And guess what? Great opportunity for us as a province with all the strengths that we have to support companies to commercialize solutions, to get them to the market. And 
it's important to note, considering the audience, that we all know that this all starts at our post-secondary institutions. The technology, the uh, startups and the innovation, I always say, starts in the doors and the hallways in the, the buildings of our post-secondary institutions. That's how we are as a country. And a lot of great technologies are uh, commercialization of intellectual property that was uh, that was either a master's PhD or ongoing research at a post-secondary institution in our province and in our country. Next slide, please. So we like to look at the auto sector broadly uh, because if we do our job right as a sector, as a province, I, I would say we are, as a country, I'd say we are, the auto sector has, has expanded. And I, and I go back to my, my analogy is that the tech sector uh, came into the auto sector, the auto sector pushed back and said, we are going to essentially suck all the sectors into the future movement of people and goods. And so that's why often it's referred to as um, the automotive and mobility sector, or some companies are now just calling themselves mobility companies, which is an indication that they're more focused on the movement of people and goods, and, and they'll have different platforms in order to enable that. But essentially, technology is taking shape. You see the auto sector uh, getting into goods movement, getting into uh, telecommunications, getting into insurance, and, and the list goes on. So we take a, a pretty broad approach. And if we do our job right, everything, all of the R&D and the innovation that's happening will be the technologies that we uh, uh, maintain, repair, and going forward. So we look at it in a fairly uh, expansive fashion. So electrification, uh, connecting autonomous vehicles, advanced air mobility, we've got a very, uh, very great project with the state of Michigan. Uh, we we have we hold the MO, MOU for the province uh, for Ontario with the state of Michigan, focused on cross border technologies. And we're currently undertaking a few things. One of them being a feasibility study for a commercial drone corridor between Windsor and Detroit. And and that it was actually uh, enabled and and powered by the automotive sector. It's just an indication of where the mindset is going in terms of the future of the sector. It's mobility. It's movement of people and goods. Light weighting is very important. It was always been important in the auto sector. Uh, when, when we back in the day when gas powered vehicles are still very much that the future um, was very strong focus on bringing down uh, corporate uh, average fuel economy. Uh, and so the, the corporate, sorry. It, and so what happened is it's still a very important, but now when you think about it uh, with battery technology, light weighting is, is actually, I would say being prioritized uh, increasingly more uh, because as you add the weight of a battery, you want to reduce the weight wherever you can while maintaining crashworthiness. Propulsion systems, I don't have to tell you, uh, future vehicles are electric. They need electric propulsion systems. So a big focus area, rail and transport, rail transportation, marine transportation, safety management controls, auto and parts manufacturing. We are, we are Canada's manufacturing hub. We, Ontario is Canada's manufacturing hub. We will always make things. And so automotive and parts manufacturing is a big priority. Aftermarket maintenance and repairs, freight and goods movement, mobility planning and infrastructure, and tool die and mold. mold. These are the segments that we look at. And as the sector expands and grows, we'll continue to expand and grow that. And I think that's kind of the secret recipe is that we don't stay uh, uh, static. We are dynamic in what we do. We're, we're, we're growing we're maneuvering with the sector. As the sector grows, we're making sure that we are lock and step with the industry so that the industry always feels that we as a province and all the stakeholders in it understand exactly where the auto sector is going, but more importantly, that we're driving the future of the automotive mobility sector. If you could take it to the next slide, please. Electrification. Um, I've heard Minister Fideli say this, and, and, I, and I'm sure others have, uh, that Province is all in on electrification. The federal government is all in on electrification. We are all in on electrification. And I can tell you, we're doing incredible in this province. We've, we've secured over $17 billion to date in new investments that are focused on electrification. We have new vehicle platforms going into our plants in a few years. Electric vehicle platforms will be built right here in this province. We have a battery facility in Windsor, Ontario that has been announced. That is our first gigafactory. We launched the first full-scale electric vehicle uh, assembly plant uh, over in Ingersoll with GM's uh, uh, Bright Drop vehicles. Just a few weeks ago, uh, Magna announced almost a half a billion dollar investment in Ontario for six plants focused on electrification. Uh, General Motors just announced that they will be building uh, electric, electric motors at their St. Catharines facility 
We are going electric in this province and we're doing a great job of it. Um, also with that, as we mentioned, the province announced in the budget and we'll likely uh, hear more about this shortly, uh, a 90 will, $91 million uh, charging uh, infrastructure fund which will support the deployment of this infrastructure so that we not only are building the cars of the future, not only are we building the batteries and the, and the technologies and the, the, uh, the components that will go into the cars of the future that we build in this province, but we'll also be able to drive those cars uh, more and more in this province through, uh, through the, the access to charging infrastructure. And here's just a few examples, uh, but we have had uh, substantial investment in this province and I would say it's record breaking. And I don't think the rally is over yet. I think, uh, you know, if I go back to some, some stuff that Minister Fideli said and, and others, we will continue to uh, to be a leader in this space and we're doing a great job in the world paying attention to Ontario. We'll continue to pay attention to Ontario, especially when it comes to the future of electric vehicles. And that includes battery manufacturing and the critical minerals that we have in this province, everything you need to make a battery in Ontario. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide, please. So, to summarize this, the objectives of Oban, and I've said this a little bit, but I'll reiterate it. Our job is to bridge Ontario's automotive technology, manufacturing, and now critical mineral clusters to support the growth of Ontario's ecosystem. To advance the growth of regional clusters and world-class testing locations to drive the deployment, adoption, piloting, smart mobility technologies across this province, including electric vehicles and powertrain. When we started this, uh, the work that we're doing in this province, every other jurisdiction was building private test beds. That's not what we did in Ontario. We said, but we're stronger together. So we went to every region in our province that has a uh, that has a, a a manufacturing cluster, that has a technology cluster, and now that has a critical mineral cluster. We asked them to work closely together, and then we connected them across the province. And that's open, and that's what we're talking about there in terms of regional clusters. Ongoing support for small and medium-sized enterprises to commercialize new technologies, helping them to scale attracts new investment to our province and to them as well, and helps them to access global markets. Executing on opportunities and tactics to strengthen Ontario's automotive and mobility workforce and talent pipeline. Huge importance. We're doing great in this province. We're, attack we're attracting investment. We're building new companies. We're growing new companies. We're developing new technologies. We want to make sure that we have the ample supply of, and that we've always had of skills and talent that will continue to power this as we continue to grow our sector driving public education, research analysis, thought leadership activities, raising awareness about Ontario, about what we have going on in this province and raising an awareness within Ontario about all the things that we're doing so well in Ontario. Convening stakeholder groups, acting as a bridge for collaborative partnerships and serving as a concierge for new entrants into Ontario's thriving ecosystem. I always say to uh, Trevor Daphne, the CEO of Invest Ontario, that their job is to bring investment to this province and that's our job to anchor the investment and immerse them into Ontario's cluster, and, and that helps us to build up our cluster. And I think that at the end of the day, our number one objective is to ensure that Ontario remains a global leader in the automotive mobility sector for years to come. Next slide, please. So here's some numbers. Uh, I won't go back to the left side, but just reiterate some of the stuff I said. But let, tell you, let me tell you how we're doing so far. And these numbers are as of March 31st, 2022. So you can expect new numbers are coming soon. But to date, we have secured over $147 million in co-investment in every project and every activity we do. We do nothing without investment from the private sector because that is a measure on whether or not we're doing what industry needs. And that helps us to build our cluster in such a way that keeps it as this, this world-renowned globally leading cluster in what we do. We've helped support the creation and retention of just under 3,000 jobs that the We've helped place and facilitate the placement of 579 R&D uh, job placements, uh, supported 77 commercialization partnerships, bringing Ontario small and medium-sized enterprises together with potential customers to co-develop technologies. We just had last week a fantastic demo with an Ontario uh, startup, a little bit bigger than a startup these days, called Asserta out of Kitchener-Waterloo. We supported Asserta to partner with Nissan. Nissan's research and development group in Japan to work on incorporating their predictive, their AI uh, based predictive maintenance uh, tool into Nissan's vehicles for a specific, uh, for a specific uh, function. The project was so important to Nissan that their the head of all of research and development for Nissan globally flew to Ontario. And the, part of the requirements that we have is a demonstration of all these technologies need to happen in our province so that we show the world of our strengths flew to Ontario for the demonstration. And that was an indication of 
how important the work that we're doing in Ontario was to Nissan. 478 small medium sized enterprises supported. Just over $300 million in follow on investment generated for those companies that we've supported and $88 million in, it, it just, we've helped catalyze $88 million of increased revenue for Ontario small and medium sized enterprises. Next slide, please. Has anybody heard about Project Arrow? I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, Project Arrow was a, an idea that the automotive, the, was, was a, a project the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association or APMA uh, um, came up with. And the idea was to create a rallying point globally to show that we in Ontario and Canada have everything you need to make a car, whether it be the components, the technology, the know-how, the skills, talent, the manufacturing capabilities, the list goes on. It was to showcase that the future vehicles will be built right here. And so what, what was done through this is this is the first all Canadian zero emission connected vehicle. Over 58 Canadian companies helped build this prototype vehicle. It was released at CES. I was there along with Flavio, the, the president of the Auto Parts Manufacturers Association and Minister Fideli for the unveiling. We actually had a guest appearance from the CEO of Stellantis. And I can tell you that this has drawn global attention along with all the other things that we're doing to all the strengths and know-how that we have right here to build the cars of the future. And this continues to attract more attention to our companies and to get people knocking on the door saying, hey, can we talk a little bit more about how we get that technology integrated into our vehicle platforms and into our solutions? Next slide, please. So I talked about critical minerals. I won't belabor the point, but I'll go back again. We're the number one producer of cobalt and nickel in Canada. Um, we are the number two producer of copper in Canada. We have 40% of all nickel produced in Canada with Ontario mines and refiners being key suppliers of class one nickel for decades. And I don't have to tell you, we have nickel lithium and we have everything you need to make a battery. And the world knows it. And it's very important. We're making sure that these batteries get made in Ontario. We've got a first, our first giga factory and we have a lot of great investment that's followed on to that. And we're making sure, the province is making sure that we have the full complement of the supply chain that will build the batteries of the future right here in Ontario. Next slide, please. And so I like to say, uh, if you look just down in the, in the right over here in the red, from Windsor to Durham, that is Ontario and Canada's traditional automotive manufacturing cluster. Uh, if you look from Waterloo to Ottawa, that's the well, you know, well-known ICT cluster. If you look at from Ottawa to Thunder Bay, that's our critical mineral cluster. And what we've done through Oven is we have brought all of these three clusters together to form Ontario's automotive mobility cluster, electric, connected, and autonomous vehicle technology. What I say to everybody is we are working together in the province. We are working all across this province to ensure that we do everything and you can come to Ontario and do anything you need to do that relates to the future movement of people and goods right here in Ontario. Next slide, please. The Ontario Smart Mobility Readiness Forum is, is very important. So we talked a lot about the commercialization of technology. Um, the opportunity that's opened itself out to, to bring new entrants into the automotive sector and wherever transformation it takes itself to. One of the important pieces we talked about as well is adoption of technology. So as we build these technologies, how do we adopt these technologies so we get the opportunity to benefit from them? Not only economically, but socially and uh, uh, environmentally. So we formed the Ontario Small Mobility Readiness Forum, and this is heavily uh, championed by the Ministry of Transportation, and we do this in partnership with Metrolinx. And this brings together uh, municipalities, infrastructure owner operators across the uh, Greater Golden Horseshoe. And the idea is that it's a forum where they can share best practices and work with peers on, on topics that are important to them, whether it be new pilots, whether it be new infrastructure they should be looking at, or technology they should be looking at, or challenges that they're facing as they move forward in the future movement of people and goods. And in this forum, I can tell you that uh, it's incredible. We, we continue to increase the number of participants in this forum, and it's been going on for a few years now, which is an indication that this forum, which is advised by all the people that participate, is a very is a very useful tool to these uh, to these municipalities, infrastructure owner operators as they push forward to this future. Uh, and and I, our our goal is to continue to expand the reach of this forum so that we can add more municipalities and infrastructure owner operators to be a part of the conversation. So we continue to push forward on that. Next slide, please. Well, 
I hope you've uh, enjoyed all the talking I've done. I am going to turn it over to Amanda Sayers, our Director of Skills, Talent, and Workforce Development, to talk a little bit more and dig deeper into the skills, talent, development strategy work that we're doing. Amanda, please. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rad. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Sayers, and I am the Director of OVIN Skills, Talent, and Workforce Development Team. It's a pleasure to be here to discuss opportunities for micro-credential development that would support Ontario's automotive talent strategy. Our work is a part of OVIN's overall mandate, and it's funded by the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training, and Skills Development. Today, I'll be sharing about OVIN's skills and talent workforce development work, including our upskilling platform and some labor market insights about skills and micro-credential development opportunities for the sector. I want you to keep in mind that all that we've just learned from RAD about Ontario's automotive and mobility sector and its expected expansion and then the immense opportunity for micro-credential development. Next slide. I currently lead the portfolio of programs and initiatives designed to future-proof the automotive and mobility sector's workforce. And notably, there's an existing workforce of over 160,000 workers within the sector, alongside 730,000 in associated industries with an anticipated increase of over 300,000 direct and a significant number as a result of indirect jobs. Such a significant increase will cause shifts in the labor market needs and the rapid upskilling and reskilling requirements for auto workers. As Rad noted, all this innovation within the sector, so that's electrification, digitalization and automation, has already led to an increase in the demand for digital skills like software development and data analysis in addition to other skills related to battery and electric vehicle production. To address the existing and anticipated gaps, OVIN Skills Talent and Workforce Development Team launched in January 2022 a few key artifacts, including our talent strategy and roadmap, which you can see a snapshot of it here. The talent strategy roadmap provides a detailed outline for Ontario's efforts to future-proof the automotive and mobility sector through targeted objectives and initiatives. Part of that strategy involves the development of an upskilling platform that I'll speak more about shortly as it relates to this audience. Our town strategy is comprised of nine initiatives that span our four objectives to collaborate across the province, develop the sector's talent pool and workforce, and advance equity, diversity, and inclusion across the sector. The full and comprehensive roadmap is available to be downloaded on our website and is meant to be used as a transparent project timeline of the government's commitment to future-proofing the workforce. It's located at ovin-navigator.ca. Next slide. Here you'll see some of our ac uh, active initiatives. Um, under objective one, we prioritize a coordinated effort across the province. So this includes collaboration with multiple ministries, active stakeholder engagement through visits and meetings with our stakeholders, which we are grateful to be able to, to do in person now, thankfully, and our various committees. To meet our objectives of talent development, we've developed our regional future workforce program, and we're currently developing a student engagement framework. And finally, our workforce development initiatives include developing a reskilling framework, an upskilling platform, and a content partnerships program. The intention for this platform is to house micro-credentials and other digital learning content to meet the needs of the automotive workforce. A corresponding content partnerships program will be launched in the spring that will offer significant funding to accelerate the development of automotive micro-credentials. Next slide. Another artifact our team launched in January, 2022 was our skills and career navigator tool, which houses information about the sector, labor market insights, including skills that are in demand and supply. The second key item is the OVEN careers pathway tool that has two useful elements to it. The first is an exploratory feature where anyone can click around and deep dive into the segments of the auto sector, as well as all of Ontario's available resources. The second feature is a personalized functionality tool where any user can create a personal profile, upload their resume if they wish, enter in their skill sets, map where they would like to work in the sector, and the result is a clear pathway to get to that career accompanied with a number of career resources, such as resume tips and interview skills overview. Last month, we launched a brand new upgraded version of this personalized tool. I encourage you all to sign in and have a look. And we are currently in the process of updating the information in the tool in general, as well as the overall user experience. Next slide. Before I move on to the research, I wanted to note that I've had the opportunity to visit quite a few post-secondary institutions across Ontario in the last year. 
including many of the institutions represented here today on the call. We've embarked on a pan-provincial roadshow here at Skills and Talent in order to establish relationships with partners across the ecosystem. And the list there is in no particular order. It's how our visits were booked based on availability for an in-person visit and a tour. So during phase one of this activity, we prioritized colleges and universities. And in the span of three months, we visited 17 institutions live and in total 39 regional organizations. And this is just one example of how important collaboration is to us here at Oven to ensure we are listening to the needs of the province. Next slide. In addition to our various programs and initiatives, Oven Skills and Talent also commissioned a labor market research uh, report, which informs all the work that we do, ensuring we develop every project in re direct response to the needs of the auto sector. Today, I'm gonna to go through some of the findings in our most recently commissioned report which explores the education and labor market trends, the gaps and opportunities for 13 segments of the automotive and mobility sector. These opportunities offer areas for the development of micro-credentials. As an aside, we're publishing a public spotlight series for each segment of the automotive and mobility value chain. And hours ago, we just published the first report of this series, a snapshot of vehicle electrification in Ontario. So take a look and uh, let me know what you think. It's located at ovenhub.ca. As a disclaimer, the information that's being shared today, so in the slides that follow, should very much be considered preliminary. There will be a comprehensive public facing report that will be available in the spring. And I'll be happy to share with the folks at eCampus to disseminate to this group as soon as it's available. Next slide. At a high level, some core insights from the report will include the fact that job postings have increased in general for most occupations tied to automotive and mobility with a greater increase in digital technologies, tradespersons, drivers, and supply chain. Due to advancing technologies, especially in segments like electrification and autonomous vehicles, there's an increasing demand for digital skills, including software design, development, and programming. In addition, gender diversity is consistently low across all segments. This indicates an opportunity to better engage underrepresented and equity-deserving equity segments of the population to fill skills and occupation gaps. Next slide. This is just a reminder of the previous slide that Raj showed that when we refer to automotive and mobility, we're referring to anything that moves people and goods. So I'd like to review some labor market trends that cover all these segments. But first, we'll start with a reminder of what we mean by electrification value chain. So next slide. So we shared this graphic during our presentation at the recent eCampus Microcredential Community of Practice meeting. So this might be familiar to some of you. When we refer to electrification, we're talking about the entire value chain that is tied to the electrification of vehicles, not just the vehicle production. So this inclu includes the sourcing of raw materials, such as mining, the production of batteries, EV manufacturing, EV auto repair and aftermarket, and specialized infrastructure development. So for example, charging stations, as Rad mentioned. And you can see at the bottom of the screen, there are a range of occupations in demand all across the value chain, just for this one segment of electrification. Next slide. So here's a review of the most in-demand occupations in electrification. We see that between 2021 and 2022, there were roughly 4,800 job postings tied to electrification with laborers in processing, manufacturing and utilities having the highest number of job postings. The top anticipated occupational gaps for the next decade include assemblers, fabricators, inspectors and testers, followed by other laborers in processing, manufacturing and utilities. Next slide. Alongside, alongside these expected increases in job postings for electrification, there's also an increase in worker displacement. We see that some major automakers, specifically Ford and Stellantis, have already confirmed layoffs for hundreds to thousands of workers to offset the costs of making EVs and the semiconductor shortage. This indicates a need to support the development of the skills needed to move forward on EV production and to provide retraining opportunities for job replacement. Next slide. In 2020 across Canada, there were 45,933 apprenticeship registrations in the automotive and mobility sector with an addition of 4,875 successful completions. 
In Ontario specifically, there were 5,787 certification completions. For apprenticeship registrations, completions, and certifications, there has been a decline nationally and provincially for various trade groups in the auto and mobility sector, ranging from trade persons like machinists, metal workers, and millwrights, to engineers, as well as information technology developers. These trade groups included in this analysis are automotive service, electricians, electronics and instrumentation, heavy duty equipment mechanics, millwrights, power plant operators, and others. Next slide. As innovation and development of new technologies occur in the sector, job requirements have evolved to fulfill the needs of the industry. There are key upskilling and reskilling needs in the sector for vehicle electrification technology, battery technology, sensor technology, and Internet of Things systems, data science, artificial intelligence and machine learning, regulation and safety knowledge, and then cybersecurity knowledge and skills. Next slide. Presented here is a quick snapshot of the most in-demand skills for all segments of automotive and mobility, including electrification, advanced air mobility, marine, rail, and all the others that were on the previous list. Across the board, we see a need for skills like strategic thinking, teamwork, ability to function in a fast paced setting and multitasking. There's also an increased demand for proficiency in technologies like enterprise resource planning software, CAD software, cloud computing and artificial intelligence. Next slide. In this next section, I'm gonna summarize the emerging skills for the occupational categories that you see on the screen. So next slide. For managers and supervisors, there's a range of emerging technical and non-technical competencies, including interpersonal skills, time management, uh, enterprise resource planning software and project management. For uh, engineering, design and technical careers, competencies include attention to detail, problem solving, Autodesk, AutoCAD and artificial intelligence. Next slide. Tradespersons and digital technology careers both see the emergence of general skills, like being able to work in a fast paced set setting and attention to detail. For trade persons specifically, emerging core skills include computerized maintenance management systems, Cronus and Autodesk combustion. For those in digital technologies, such skills include JavaScript, CAD software, and cloud computing. Next slide. Retail operations have seen the increased use of enterprise resource planning software as well, point of sale software and PeopleSoft, alongside non-technical skills like the ability to work in a fast-paced setting again, team leadership and flexibility. Meanwhile, transportation and supply chain skills include use of structured query language such as SQL, global positioning systems or GPS software, and electronic data interchange systems. Next slide. Finally, emerging skills for manufacturers that differ from other classifications include computer numerical control, CNC software, and Epicore. Drivers are seeing an increased demand for the use of macros, routing software, and PeopleNet. Next slide. Across the fields of study connected to the aforementioned career segments, there are a range of employment opportunities across segments of the sector, meaning that the development of micro-credentials tied to core skills in any of these fields of study would be in high demand as the sector undergoes change. Our focus here at OVEN is on moving the dial forward on the development of micro-credentials for all fields connected to automotive and mobility. And we're looking forward to not only see, but participate in the upskilling efforts for the sector specific skills. Next slide. Thank you so much for having Rad and I here today. And please feel free to contact us if you'd like any more information about anything that was discussed, or if you have any ideas for collaboration. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Amanda and Rad. That was a really fantastic overview. Um, we've got plenty of time for some questions, so I'll encourage folks to uh, uh, send those along through the channel. Um, a, a couple of observations for me. I mean, first of all, like what a what an incredible amount of work you you have done to date, and and in your work with others, and as you say, uh, Rad with Minister Fideli. Uh, in attracting the investment to uh, to Ontario, 
I think the, you know, the, the need to transition into a, a no or low carbon economy is so acute. And when we can be a leader in the world at transitioning such an important industry as the mobility industry or set of industries, I guess, um, like it's just, it's really phenomenal to see the, the confluence of, I guess I would call it social and economic policy uh, that is going to have meaningful impacts on the ground for pretty much everybody. Uh, so kudos to you for the amazing work that you've done, Amanda. Uh, that was a, a great uh, uh, cover of the skills and competencies required. And I, I think the, you know, it occurs to me as I listen to you that the automotive industry itself offers an excellent model for partnership. You know, we, we, We've heard the, I've heard, you would probably know the exact thing, but like auto parts manufacturers are, you know, sending things over the border, what, five or six times or something as part of the manufacturing process before it gets into a vehicle somewhere. And all of that requires really, really tight and seamless uh, coordination across the entire value chain. And that kind of model of tight coordination, you've really, uh, I think, exemplified in bringing that to the development of skills. I love the Oven uh, Career Navigator, uh, by the way. I think uh, when I first saw that, maybe about a year or so ago, I can't remember now, when it first came out, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like this, this basically says like, here's the, here's the road forward. Uh, and you can, you can get on that road and actually drive yourself by acquiring these skills or aligning uh, yourself to these skills and competencies. Uh, and I mean, the, I, I haven't actually seen the new uh, personal uh, navigator, uh, but now that uh, I've heard that it's new and improved, uh, you can expect to see uh, a bump in uh, in traffic there. Um, so thank you for that. That was a really, really cool uh, overview of the important work that you're doing in an important sector of the economy. And actually, at the outset, you talked about the impact of jobs. And, and I had yesterday as well in my opening remarks to Presage today, and today as well talked about the 125,000 jobs, but those are only the direct jobs. And Amanda, you mentioned like the the other, like all of the other indirect jobs. It's really, really quite a significant impact. Um, but it's a good segue into one of the points you made in the first uh, question that came through the channel here, um, which is how many people are at risk of being displaced from the workforce if we don't get these micro-credential programs built? So, I, I mean, I think it's a great question because it it's it's kind of the cost of, of not doing what you were doing. So I don't know if one of you wanna comment a bit on that. I can try first. Um, I don't think we've quantified that yet. What I would say is we're at a great place in the journey where all the post-secondary institutions, as well as ourselves, the industry partners, they're realizing there's a need for micro-credentials right now. So I would say right now, we're at a great place. I don't see risk with this displacement as a result of micro-credentials not being ready. However, if we don't start this journey soon in the next year, I would say, mm -hmm. the risk will increase because the industry is moving very, very quickly and hence why Ovin's concerted effort to push post-secondary institutions forward and make them realize the importance of this and developing this. But we haven't quantified it yet. And I think we, we may measure that in the next couple of months, maybe to a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Rad, if you want to add anything to that. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna present a hypothesis. Uh, I actually think we're, we're talking about research worker. Uh, you know, <laughs> I actually think that we're doing such incredible work in terms of new investment and building new companies that um, we're going to have to be uh, very mindful of making sure that we have enough talent uh, and workforce to support all the great investments that are coming to this province. And we will, if we work diligently and together on it, we will continue to do it. And, and I can tell you that, you know, uh, along with being all in on electrification at the province of Ontario and the federal government is, they are going, they're working at all aspects on what we require. And it's a global, you know, this is a global uh, uh, race, as we might say, and I think we're winning and we'll continue to win it. Uh, everybody's looking at this in such a way, but I will tell you that when we do, like, for example, our part of the state of Michigan, they always ask us about our talent. So we've always been well known as a high achieving um, in terms of degrees, in terms of uh, education in general, whatever education might take, we're a very educated uh, population. And, you know, the way we learn has changed quite rapidly. I mean, even just like, you know, I, I worked full time 
while I did my math, my first master's degree and my second master's degree. And, and I kind of worked full time, full time. And, and I used to actually go to physical class at school. And at the time, learning was changing a little bit. You could do a little bit more virtual. It's getting better to do virtual. Yeah. You know, I have had staff that have done uh, three or four micro degrees on their own time while working with us. And the, the level of, the, first of all, the way people learn is changing, also especially if they're working. So for us to ensure that we continue to have the best talent in the world, and, and oftentimes they're powering the big companies, but most of the time they're powering our small companies. And so it's actually in our best interest to make sure that they're always up to speed. And as, as, as things are changing much more rapidly, the speed is getting a lot quicker. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to keep, keep the speed a lot more. We need to keep, we have to get up to speed a lot quicker. And so that's where the really big importance of all of this is, is people learn differently. Um, they learn in different ways now. They're taken in, in different chunks. It may not be full degrees, but maybe specific topics. But also, you want to be able to take that and, and go from, I mean, when I got my first degree, it was, and anybody else, it was to get a job. I mean, I think everybody, I mean, or, or to do another degree, whatever, whatever you might be doing. Uh, but you can That's still a job. Getting another, another degree job. is still a job. Still another job, right? And the idea is that um, not only is it great to continuously learn and to learn in different ways and to learn in smaller chunks that are much more manageable, especially when you're working full time in the sector. So we're keeping our separate sector for us. But also it's, it's super important to be able to take something when you go to your next job and say, I'm an expert in cybersecurity. Well, how do I know you're an expert in cybersecurity? We used to show there are degrees. Now we might show some other credentials. And the idea is that it stays with that individual as they go and as they upgrade themselves in their career and their path um, uh, into the workforce or wherever they go. So I think that's, that's probably the bigger opportunity. The bigger opportunity is to make sure that um, as technology is really just changing the way things are moving and how quickly they're moving and how quickly we have to learn about new things and how quickly we have to step speed, making sure that we're getting that information and that opportunity and those courses and the, the ability to say, I did this to our talent. So they, we remain to be the highest uh, educated uh, population, whatever it may be, and the highly, highest skilled population, how to make sure our workforce is world renowned as it is and will continue to be. It's important to note, I don't know if anybody knows, I didn't say this in that, that the number one quality uh, output facility of the entire Toyota production system has for many years been Toyota's facility in Cambridge, globally. Amazing. That is a testament to the workforce and the skills that we have in this province. And it's well known. Yeah, uh, you know, I think you're, you're right. We, we actually have the highest educated population uh, in the G7. Two thirds of our population have a tertiary credential when you consider both university and college, uh, like tertiary type A and type B. And what I really like about how you've presented the OVEN career navigator is it's a mix of the type of education that we require, which is, you know, we're, we're really good at, at producing like people from across the range of, of credentials, if you will, all from apprenticeships all the way up to the, uh, the scientific doctorates and the medical doctorates, of course. Uh, so I, I think that that complementarity that you have approached this with is really refreshing because it lets people select their way in uh, to the path that they like. But it points to, uh, it's a nice segue into the next question, which is, what would you say would be the biggest challenge for post-secondary education stakeholders in navigating this shift, especially those who lead institutional micro-credential work? Sure, I can take that one again first. Um, you know, with something like this, it's so exciting. It's building such a buzz. We see all the investment, et cetera. And so just, I think the volume, right? The number of micro-credentials that are possible, the fact that the sector is expanding the way that it is. We have so many intersecting industries, you know, coming into one, one place, it's, I think it's going to be a challenge to pick and choose the hot topic. What's the micro-credential I need to create now? Which one's going to have the highest impact? And we can't forget that the most important piece in all of this is the worker, right? We're creating micro-credentials for those in the automotive workforce to make sure they feel like they can continue in their career journey. And I heard a nice conversation at the conference yesterday that we have to think about, um, how comfortable these workers so there's something very nice and unique about these workers how comfortable are they going to be to go back to school are they going to want to do only online will they need hybrid will it be live are there some roles in auto that 
has to be live with the micro credentials. So I think it's just the size of this might be tricky to navigate. And that's yeah. where I think partnerships with industry are going to be very important. Yeah, to I would agree. Pinpoint, I mean, yeah. To pinpoint and prioritize basically where to start. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, that rapidity, we certainly heard that uh, yesterday. And I know that the infrastructure that we provide in particular is a good, and we have a good partnership with you to that, that helps us, you know, I guess would be the clutch driving metaphor uh, between the two gears uh, that need to be linked, which is really what I see OCI and Oven is doing. Uh, it's really, uh, it's really, really uh, fantastic to see. Um, we have a comment uh, here um, all the way from Turin, Italy. So the international audience of the uh, 2023 eCampus Ontario Microcredential uh, Forum. I'll just read it. Uh, this is from Eduardo Castelbranco. Thanks for this overview. Very strategic. I'm interested in the labor market study, Amanda. A, what sources of data are you using? Conventional stats are also real-time LMI, uh, labor market information. Please, could you share a bit more on the use of this occupational and skills demand data with workforce development and especially with the development of micro-credentials? And then there's a part C, if you're following the plot. Uh, is the education and training sector listening to you? Thanks for the wonderful presentation, Eduardo Castelbranco from Turin, Italy. Sure. So for the labor market study, um, yeah, so it's definitely the traditional economic research with Statistics Canada and relevant databases. Uh, but also we are doing an industry survey. We're also doing quite a bit of focus groups as we're building out this story, hence why hopefully it's it's landing strategically. Um, and then the last question. So in regards to sharing the reports, as soon as they're ready, basically, we're very transparent and open. We post everything so everyone can learn and, and use. And then the last, sorry, what was that last part of his comment? Uh, is the education and oh. training sector listening to you? Yeah. Sure. So when we went through those 17 visits, uh, that's the reason why I want to go in person, right, to read the room, to see facial expressions, especially a lot of this we were introducing for the first time. Um, and I would say the majority, if not all post-secondary institutions were quite excited about an opportunity to participate and saw a lot of value in, in developing micro-credentials and, and being a part of, of, of the projects and the sector itself. So. Amazing. Yeah, I just want to applaud uh, your your engagement and and just really focus on that complementarity that we have, you know, world leading educational institutions in our indigenous institutes, our colleges, and our universities that are taking an increasingly complementary approach to things like uh, uh, sponsored industrial sponsored R and D, for instance, linking up basic research with applied research and experimental development. Um, so I really think your approach there is, is really the right one. Rab, I've been given the two minute warning. So uh, I'm going to uh, throw it to you to uh, close the show. Robert, well, listen, this has been incredible. Uh, you know, I think one thing that I always say, and I, I would always say that the strength and, you know, the secret recipe, I, we could ask this often. What do, you know, I, I, very, very actually, Somebody from the state of Michigan called me once and said, when we were comp contemplating what we wanted to do on the next iteration of our initiative, our auto industry said, look towards Ontario. So what are you doing? I said, it's very simple. We're working together. We're all in the conversation. We're working at it together. And we're working through it together. And that is the strength. It is the secret recipe. And it is, it is the secret sauce of Oven. It's all of Ontario. We're working at it together, all stakeholders, all in a room, figuratively, walk, working through the transformation of this sector in every aspect of it. And that only makes us stronger as a jurisdiction, only makes us stronger as individual groups. And it sends a message globally that Ontario's got our act together, and we really do. And the numbers show that. Driving prosperity has produced the outcomes that it intended to produce. Our jurisdiction is doing things that no other jurisdiction is doing, and we're not done yet. So if I can leave everybody with anything, working together is the most important thing that we can do. Working through things together is the most important thing that we could do. And we have a lot of opportunity, and a lot of work uh, ahead of us. So let's stick together. Let's work at it together. And let's make sure that we're really doing the things that are required for us to really move the needle. Because we've created a brand, and we've sent a message globally, and we want that message to remain strong as we drive forward. Excellent way to uh, sum up an excellent presentation by you both. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Rahad. That was uh, just a really excellent uh, uh, discussion. 
Uh, I love the uh, the rejoinder to uh, to work together. Uh, you, both of you personally, but OVIM and OCI are leaders in the Ontario. In fact, I would say across the country in terms of how you're bringing people together and and uh, letting everybody get a seat on that bus. Uh, and nobody even has to call shotgun because it's a it's an autonomous vehicle. So there's no driver in the uh, passenger side. So kudos to you for that. Uh, so thank you again for making the time today to address everybody. Thanks everybody for participating. We're going to take a five minute break now and you can in five minutes click the little link, I think on the lower left of your uh, feed loop screen. Um, and please join us back here at 2.40. Uh, where we'll talk with Adam Hopkins and Ashley Maracle from the First Nation Technical Institute and learn about their approach to community-based micro-credentials. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robert.